My name is Chad Sockwell, and I'm an undergraduate in the Scientific Computing Department here at Florida State University. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Scientific Computing and explain what we do here in the Scientific Computing Department. So first, we're going to go over what is Scientific Computing, and I'm going to explain a little bit about it and how it works. And then we're going to talk about how Scientific Computing can be used to show uh, agreement between simulations and experiments. Next, we're going to talk about how it can be used to complement experiments. And then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about how you can use it to complement theory. Scientific computing, or computational science, is an interdisciplinary science, which means that we use tools for mathematics and computer science and combine it to any other science that has problems that need to be solved. So, for instance, you could pick something very physical, like physics or engineering or chemistry, or you could even apply these methods to, let's say, biology or economy. Um, usually the first question I get asked is, is scientific computing the same thing as computer science? And the answer is no. And then the second question I get asked is, what's the difference? Well, the difference is, is in computer science, they really strive to try to build the best possible computer using optimized software that they've created. Whereas in scientific computing, we want to take that best possible computer and use it to solve problems, and solve those problems efficiently. So typically, um, computational scientists fall into two groups. The first group is those who really just use the algorithms. And this may be a computational physicist or computational biologist that just strives to use uh, algorithms or software or computer code to solve problems that they have. Whereas the second group really try to improve algorithms and software and implement these algorithms in new places that they haven't been used before. So the second group really shares the true spirit of scientific computing. Um, here at the Scientific Computing Department at Florida State, we really aim to solve new problems and improve the problem-solving methods that we already have. So typically we have some physical phenomenon um, I'm going to talk a lot about physics in particular because I'm also a physicist. Um, and so we have this physical phenomenon and we want to model it with some numerical algorithm which is really just a set of directions to solve some problem. And you really want to try to take advantage of what computers do best. And some of these things lie in, let's say, a, a complicated domain or nonlinearity for a partial differential equation or even if you have some uh, large set of numbers and you want to run some statistics on it, you would rather do that with a computer than sit there and do it by hand. Uh, Monte Carlo methods are also a very nice method to use on a computer, which are essentially picking out random parameters to run into your code. And then finally, large matrix equations and eigenvalue problems are very, very easily solved on a computer, whereas they might be very hard to do by hand. And so these are all problems that we would try to solve on a computer and convert our physical problem into some kind of computer code and possibly some kind of simulation on the computer that reproduces this physical phenomenon. So why should you care? Well, every day computers are becoming more powerful and they're, they're getting everywhere and everybody's using them and everyone has a cell phone in their pocket now. So computers are really becoming a very important part of our life. Um, Florida State's Research Computing Center has a high-performance computer which has 403 nodes which are essentially computer boxes and in all those boxes they have a little over 6,000 CPU cores and we use this to run our codes and it saves us a lot of time. We can run them in parallel and run pieces of the code on several different computers and gain a large speed up. And so I mean this is one way where we can really take advantage of scientific computing. Furthermore, Today, science and computers really play a symbiotic role. If you were to go read some research papers on, let's say, physics or chemistry or biology, you would see a lot of their work involves computers and running data. And it's getting to the point where we have so much data for things that we need computers to run them. Um, you can, like, like I said earlier, you can also do numerical simulations to try to complement experiments in theory. And so we're going to go over that in a little bit. But first, most importantly, you need to get your simulation to agree with an experiment to try to verify your code or your simulation and prove that it's right. And so 
This is known as verification and validation, and this is extremely critical in, in knowing what you're doing is correct. Some scientists may scoff and say, you know, nothing new was done. You've just reproduced something I've done with my hands. But this is actually just a critical stepping stone and able to, to show that your code works. And then once you know that it works, you can make predictions with it in the future. So some people are also suspect of the numerical error associated with an algorithm. But this is where verification comes in. Typically, in some kind of experimental application or physical application, you have some kind of measurable uncertainty due to your measuring device. And if you can take your simulation and make your numerical error smaller than that experimental uncertainty, you can actually reproduce the physical results faithfully. And so I'm going to have some nice examples of that here in a little bit. So first off, um, Ben Chen of Florida State's Research Computing Center decided he was going to take his uh, computer code, which, uh, show, which does gravitational lensing, and I have a nice little diagram of that. Um, here we have the Earth, and we have some galaxy far, far away, and we have some large mass cluster in the middle. And so gravitational lensing consists of finding how this big mass bends the starlight. And typically, it bends it in a way where it produces multiple images around this large mass due to general relativistic effects. And so here, Ben Shen found a, a picture from the movie Interstellar, and he wanted to see if this was just some uh, graphic artist rendering of a black hole doing gravitational lensing, or is it really a physical situation that could happen out in nature? So he took his code, and he tried to reproduce the effects seen in this picture. And what he found was is that he could actually indeed faithfully represent them. And so he found out that these people actually did their homework and they actually created a physical situation. And it turns out the people from Interstellar that produced this were actually astrophysicists from Caltech. So they knew what they were doing. Now, although this is an experimental situation, Ben could have used his code to possibly verify his code with some black hole image out in space just as easily. And I think it's a neat, neat little trick he did. Um, we have another example from uh, Dr. Palua and Tim Handy and some of their postdocs. Um, they're, they're working on supernovas and how the shock propagates through a supernova. And there's a, a laboratory which has an omega laser which is trying to reproduce some of these shock effects by firing a laser at a target and looking at the shock that results. Um, to the left, we have the actual experimental data taken from the lab. And as you can see, there's a shock wave in the front where it's marked shock. And there's some long spikes coming off from the, the black pillars seen more to the left. Um, the simulation is shown to the right and reproduces the shock pretty well. But it's still a very active field of research to try to model these spikes over here on the left. No one has quite figured out how to do it. And so this is actually an active field where they're trying to figure out how to verify their code and how to make it agree with experiment. So here are some more pictures here. I think these are a little more illuminating of what's going on. But you can see to the, to the left, there's one substance here in the black. And this is where the shock has taken place after the laser is fired. And you can see that this black substance is starting to leak into the lighter substance over here. Um, this is something called Rayleigh-Taylor instability and comes from the relative density of the two materials. I just wanted to give you all a little bit more background on it. So next, um, I have another example from one of our professors, Brian Quaith. Um, he's trying to reproduce some water flow through this nifty little device that MIT has created. What they've done is they've taken uh, a very small piece of plastic and essentially lined another thin piece of plastic on top of it but they're separated by a very small distance and there's several pillars in between the little gap to prevent the water flow or to obstruct it in some fashion. And so what they've done is they, they take the water and they flow it through very slowly so the Stokes equations can be used, which just essentially means the water is moving very slowly. And they have an experimental setup where they uh, take, where they take, where they record the velocity um, U here is the, the uh, transversal velocity, and V here is the longitudinal velocity. 
And where you see red and orange, these very bright colors, is where the water is moving very fast. Um, below these, these top two graphs for U and V, you see Brian's simulation. And if you look at it pretty closely, it represents the experiment very well. Um, his simulation captures a lot of the effects of, of the experiment. Where you see that the water up here is moving very quickly, known by, seen by these red spots, you see the same red spots in his numerical data. However, his code, although it captures the spots, his are a little too red. Um, it's predicting the water to move a little faster than it actually is, but overall it worked pretty well. And I have some line graphs which uh, explain things a little better. Here's that longitudinal velocity, and you can see that the curves almost match exactly, and so does the, the mean value, which is the dotted line down the middle. But if you look at the ends where the water's moving the fastest, his simulation starts to break away from the experiment a little bit. And so you can see that in these spots here, where they're not quite the same brightness, but they do occur in the same spot. Um, he has another graph for the transverse velocity, and once again it matches it, the experimental data very well, except for on the ends where the velocity starts to pick up. So I have a nice little uh, movie where uh, Brian has uh, taken some different liquids and marked their initial uh, spot by a color, and he lets them flow down the little apparatus, and he sees how they mix. And so I think this is a nice little simulation that can simulate mixing in, let's say, I don't know, a river or an ocean and many other things like that. So the next thing we have to talk about is scientific computing complementing experiment. So we've verified and validated our code. We know that it works. It predicts what we want it to. So now we can try to make some future predictions of things that we're not so sure about now that we trust our code. Um, some places where this can be very advantageous is where an uh, experiment may not be feasible, such as out, you know, light years away uh, on a star, or maybe it's far too expensive, you don't have the manpower or the money to perform all the experiments physically, but you can use simulations to try to, you know, filter through these experimental situations, possibly find the area you really want to probe into physically, and drastically cut down your experiment time, and possibly save money. And so I have some more examples. Um, Dr. Schombach and Steve Hunke, one of his uh, postdocs, decided they were going to do some tests on a brittle material with some ballistic projectile. And they wanted to know how discretizing the grid affected the results that they got. And so they discretized the grid in two different ways. One had a square grid. Another one had something called a centroid Voronoi tessellation grid. Um, and then they had this set up like this, where they have some projectile coming down, some ballistic projectile coming in at a brittle material. Possibly you could say it's a tank armor, a Kevlar, or bulletproof material. And then they wanted to see how the molecular dynamics are affected by this impact. And so where you see red is where the, uh, where the molecules have completely split apart and where you see blue is where they're still intact and bonded strongly. And the green is somewhere in between. And so he has various plots for where this uh, projectile impacts the surface for very discretizations. And he found out that the discretization does affect the impact. But what, really, what we're really concerned about is how we can simulate experiments using the same kind of software. And so you can imagine you may have some tank armor, or, or some expensive material that you don't really want to go out there and blast away every day. You can possibly save money by running simulations and seeing the effects on a computer, and then you can go test it in reality once you have a good feel for what you're doing, and you can cut down the amount of experiments dramatically. Furthermore, you could try to optimize your experiments, such as uh, having a material that protects from a certain projectile, and you could enter those parameters into the code, run the experiment on the computer, and then take that information and see if it works in real life. And so it's a nice way to dig through experiments without having to run all this data by hand. So finally, I want to talk a little bit about complementing theory. Typically in sciences, um, you come up with some very complicated models to try to capture a natural phenomenon. And to solve these analytically, or by hand, you have to come up with some crafty approximations. 
Some of these are, you know, simple domains, such as uh, reducing dimensions, maybe to one dimension, um, and possibly looking at asymptotic behavior, such as looking at the behavior, you know, far towards infinity, or maybe close to zero. And this can be useful to get insight. But if you really want to get the full picture, you can use a numerical method to crank out the whole solution for the whole model on the computer. And essentially, a numerical method uh, kind of works like a hammer and the world's a nail. You can bang anything you want to, and within some reason, it should work. So in scientific computing, we try to aim at improving these algorithms and you know, try to handle more complicated models and solve them thoroughly. So first, um, I'm going to show a little bit of my research. I work in vortex dynamics and superconductors. And so what I do, all on a computer, is I set up some uh, superconducting material and I place it in a magnetic field. And due to the material, it's only penetrated by the magnetic field in these little flux tubes. And then what I do is I apply current and I see how these flux tubes move. Now unfortunately, the model that describes these uh, flux tube dynamics it's very complicated, and it's known as the Ginzburg-Landau equation. And essentially, I'm solving for this psi here and this a here, and what I have is a system of nonlinear, time-dependent, partial differential equations, which is the nasty mouthful. But fortunately, I can use a numerical method and crank this all out on a computer. And I don't have to do it by hand. And honestly, I wouldn't even know where to start by hand. And so I use something called the finite element method, and I make a nice simulation here um, where you see red are the actual vortices penetrating through the superconductor. And I turn on the magnetic field here in the first plot and the vortices start coming in and they start arranging themselves in, in, these, in, uh, in these impurities that are outlined by the black lines. And so once they get in this nice lattice here in this third picture, I turn on the current and hopefully they don't move because when they move it messes things up. And sure enough, they stay pinned to their little impurity sites. Now once again, doing this by hand would have been very hard for me. I don't know how I would have got those impurities in there. I don't know how I would have figured out how to plot this function once I solved for it that I don't even know how to solve for by hand. But once again, I put it on the computer, I solve everything, I get pretty pictures and nice information that tells me about the physical phenomenon. Another example is from Ben Chen. Um, he used his code to, to make some plots for Faraday rotation, which is a predicted but not yet observed phenomenon associated with gravitational lensing. So over here to the, to the right, you see uh, uh, an image made by some people at MIT. Um, and they've kept this code under wraps because they want to do some more research with it, and they're not quite ready to release it. And it's also written in a slightly not so user friendly language um, in C. Well, what Ben has done is he's actually reproduced the results very well, and he's done it in a more user friendly language. He's done it in MATLAB and Python, which are a lot easier for scientists that don't know how to program so well to use. And so he can actually use this, this code to make predictions about data and give it to astronomers and tell them where to look. And so they can possibly take this theory and go out and look for this Faraday rotation and so that it can be observed and proved. So finally, I want to conclude and see what we've gone over. We know a little bit about scientific computing and what it is. Um, I've told you that it can be used for any science that really uses computing. I'm a physicist, so I've really just used it for physics here, but don't let that worry you. You could apply it to biology, economics, chemistry, engineering, neuroscience, anything you can think of just about. Um, so we've also seen how it can be used to, in applications, in experiments, in theory. And next time, if I come back or when I come back, we'll talk a little bit more about the department and a little bit more about some of the research that goes on there.